You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And one of the things that we want to do and enjoy doing most on Shalom TV is introducing you to the men and women who are making an extraordinary contribution very often behind the scenes or in ways in which the average Jew just is unaware. But these are individuals, men and women, who through their creativity and their contribution to Jewish life are shaping the Jewish future in an extraordinary way. And so on this edition of L'Chaim, I have a, an extraordinary opportunity to speak to exactly that kind of individual. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Jim Tish, James Tish, who is now the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Jewish Agency. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Jewish Agency, the Jewish Agency is really the organization in the Jewish world which for years has been at the heart of Jewish life. It was the Jewish agency which helped shape and create the State of Israel, which basically was the organizing force in pre-state Israel through the mandate period. And then once the State of Israel was created, the Jewish agency was the organization which was primarily involved in bringing immigrants with Aliyah, bringing Jews from all over the world into the state of Israel and then helping them to become part of the Israeli scene, to feel at home in their new world in the state of Israel. And for years and years and years, the Jewish agency has been at the forefront of what the state of Israel has become over the past 60 years. Recently, the Jewish agency has change direction to some extent. Natan Sharansky is now the chairman, active chairman who, who heads the Jewish agency. And the goal at the moment seems to be more about creating Jewish life and the nature of Jewish identity around the world than it is about Aliyah. And one of the things we want to talk to Jim about is to what extent is the Jewish agency still involved in Aliyah. But now the chairman of the board of governors of the Jewish agency which is the individual who, with Natan Sharansky, is going to be instrumental in creating the future of the Jewish world through the Jewish agency, is Jim Tish. I want to tell you a little bit about him. In addition to his work with the Jewish agency, Jim Tish is the chief executive officer of Lowe's Corporation. He's also the chairman of the board of the Educational Broadcasting Corporation and chairman of the parent company of WNET Channel 13 and WLIW Channel 21, the PBS television stations in the greater New York metropolitan area. Jim Tish is also the director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a director of the New York Public Library, and a trustee of Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York. In terms of his Jewish work, he is the past president of UGA Federation of New York, past chairman of the Board of Trustees of United Jewish Communities, and a past chairman of the Board of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. And if you're a sports fan, the Tisch family also owns the football New York Giants. What a wonderful pleasure it is for me to sit with you, Jim. Thank you for agreeing to give me some time. I very It's my very pleasure. Appreciate. Thank you. So the Jewish Agency is now one of your new preoccupations. To what extent, you heard in the open that I talked about how it used to be um, associated almost exclusively with Aliyah and bringing Jews in and, and making them comfortable with the state of Israel. And now the focus seems to be with so many communities having been saved by the Jewish world that the emphasis that Natan Sharansky talks about is trying to develop and strengthen Jewish identity among Jews in the diaspora as well as within the state of Israel. 
in terms of your own perspective, to what extent do you want the Jewish agency to be doing, and to what extent are you comfortable with the new direction of the Jewish agency? So let me, let me start at the beginning. Please. <clears throat> because I think you did a marvelous job with a recitation of the history of the Jewish agency. But I think, I think it's very important to remember where the Jewish agency came from uh, in order to understand where we're going. Thank you. As, you, as you said, it was the government of Israel before there was an Israel. It was the organizing force. And the first chairman of the Jewish agency uh, was David Ben-Gurion. And once the state of Israel was uh, founded, then the Jewish agency's mission changed, and the mission became that of Aliyah, seeing to the in-migration of Jews to Israel. And to this day, three million people in Israel can trace their being in Israel back to the Jewish agency. But uh, as I think we all know, the major migration to Israel as far as we can see, has ended. And it ended uh, with the Jewish agency bringing a million Russians to Israel basically in the 80s and 90s and the very first part of 2000. And that has now trickled down. And so that mission of Aliyah is not as big as it was in the past uh, 50 or 60 years. <clears throat> and so the mission of the Jewish agency uh, is adapting to the times. And it is, uh, in my opinion, the mission of Jewish peoplehood is as big and as important as the mission of Aliyah. Because if we don't see to the renewal of, of uh, Jewish people, if we don't see to uh, Jews feeling more affiliated with the Jewish people, if we don't see to uh, creating an environment where there is much less intermarriage, then we all know what the demographers tell us, that the Jews will disappear. And this is, this in my opinion, is a mission, and Natan says this best, this is a mission that is vital to Israel because, as Natan Sharansky says, the Jews in Israel, the Israelis, need the diaspora, and diaspora Jews need Israel. The reason that uh, Israel needs diaspora Jews is because uh, we Jews outside of Israel are a political force that can help create support from our governments for Israel. And we see that very clearly here in the United States. Um, and the reason we Jews in the diaspora need Israel because Israel really is uh, a central light, a lighthouse for uh, Jews, both religious and non-religious. And so the Jewish agency is busy at work uh, creating those programs uh, which will, will uh, make people more affiliated with Israel and with their Jewish identity. Uh, permit me, please, to articulate the one criticism I hear sort of circulating in the Jewish world in general. And it is that, that's the, that, that the Jewish agency had a focus for a long period of time, and it was good at what it did. And that this new focus, this new goal of strengthening Jewish identity as valuable and as laudable as it is, the Jewish agency isn't set up to address it as well as other organizations might be. And that the Jewish agency is misdirecting itself. And maybe, some even said, the Jewish agency has had its time. It will be forever um, respected and honored in the ways that we've discussed. But that going forward, this is not what the Jewish agency was set up to do, and therefore it's not the agency that should be doing it now, that there are other organizations better suited to worry about how do you strengthen Jewish identity. What would you say? I would say I disagree with you. I would say Natan Sharansky disagrees with you. And I would say the Prime Minister of the State of Israel disagrees with you. 
Uh, the, the, we have a very close working relationship with the government of Israel and with the Prime Minister. Uh, and this is a mission that the government of Israel and the Prime Minister strongly, strongly supports. It's, um, it's a mission that is very important, phenomenally important to the long term of the Jewish mm -hmm. people. And I would submit to you, it's a mission that the Jewish agency can actually execute better than anyone else. Because the Jewish agency, number one, being based in Israel, uh, is able to put together programs that bring Jews to Israel. The, the, the thing that has become abundantly clear is that if you can bring young Jews under the age of 30 to Israel for an extended period of time, their affiliation with Israel and their affiliation with Judaism grows dramatically. So that uh, uh, Jews that have been there uh, two times for an extended period of time, they are more than twice as likely to marry another Jew. Mm -hmm. And uh, the similar statistics show that they're twice as likely to uh, affiliate with Israel and be supportive of Israel. So this is, this is a mission that's uh, uh, as important to Israel as it is to Jewish peoplehood. And Israel can't survive, as, as I said before, without Jews in the diaspora and vice versa. It's interesting, at one point, you know, the whole ethic was you had to go to Israel. There seems to be a greater appreciation for the importance of there being a diaspora Jewish community now than there may have been 60 years ago when the State of Israel was first created. Yes. 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 Yeah. And it pleases me very, very much. And there seems to be a, a partnership now of Israel and world Jewry, especially with American Jewry and other main centers of Jewish life today than there was at one point. And so it's lovely to hear you say this, and it's lovely that that's the uh, perspective of the Jewish agency. In all fairness, that wasn't my comment. And my own comment, my own feeling is that when I hear Natan speak, I think he speaks eloquently uh, about the I was the going importance. to interrupt you before you even started <laughs> saying that to say that there is no doubt in my mind that Natan, the selection of Natan Sharansky right. as the professional head of the Jewish agency was a truly inspired, Absolutely. inspired decision. Natan, for those that may not know, was uh, a prisoner of Zion, was imprisoned in the Russian gulag for years and years. He is short, he is pugnacious, and he, he is totally honest and totally believes in Israel and Jewish peoplehood. Mm -hmm. So he is, he is what I call our spiritual leader because he, he really does provide the inspiration for this organization. Look, the, the Jewish agency, there's no doubt in my mind, the Jewish agency went through a period, a, long, a relatively long period, where it was viewed as a bureaucratic backwater for washed up Israeli politicians. I even felt that. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt, and, and lots of people thought that, and that was the reputation of the Jewish agency. But I would submit to you that today it is a dramatically different organization. It's slimmed down, it's got true professional management, that knows what they're doing, they're on a mission, and there's no doubt in my mind that they're going to accomplish this. I, you know, you never know, how, excuse me for going on this. I this, love it. But, um, so you, you recited my, uh, my history of leadership in Jewish organizations. Correct. I, I cha chaired a uh, UJA Federation agency and then I chaired UJA Federation, and then I went on to chair UJC, which is now the JFNA, and then I chaired the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. I, and I finished that job about five years ago, and I figured, all right, <laughs> I've, You've I've, done it. I've done my time in the Jewish community, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to sit back, I'm going to read the newspapers, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be knowledgeable about what goes on, but 
You'll uh, be on the sidelines? I'm, I'm on the sidelines. And I, I promise you, I'm really, really good about standing on the sidelines. And then in November, Natan Sharansky called. And he said, Jim, would you be the chairman, uh, would you consider being the chairman of the Jewish Agency? And this is from the, you never know how you're going to respond until you're actually confronted with it, department. I couldn't help myself. I said, yes. You have no idea how many people around me said, Jim, you're crazy for doing this. But I could not say no to Natan. And I had this strong sense that the Jewish agency had turned the corner and that it was uh, going to move on again to greatness. So here I am. OK. And it, 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 I, I say this with a certain, uh, who am I to say this? We're very lucky that you did say yes. I love the story. It's so real, Jim. You've been an observer of Jewish life virtually your entire professional time. When you look at the American Jewish scene today, do you worry, and if you do, to what extent do you worry that the rate of assimilation and the extent to which there are those younger Jews who in some way feel distanced from the state of Israel because they don't have 60 years of history and, and then some, they weren't around when there was no state of Israel. They weren't around for the Six-Day War. They weren't around for the Soviet Jewry movement, which brought ultimately Natan Sharansky out of prison to Israel. And they haven't faced the kind of anti-Semitism that many of the older generation of Jews living in America experienced. And therefore, there is this disconnect for many young Jews. And I said to myself, of all the things I wanted to hear you, Jim Tish, talk about, was how you feel when you look at the American Jewish landscape. And to what extent, where, do you, where, do you, where are you hopeful? And where are you realistically concerned? Um, I'm hopeful, first of all, that we actually can turn the tide of assimilation. And I, I think it's, it's through projects like what the Jewish Agency is doing both in Israel and also here in the United States. We didn't talk about the shlichim that are sent here to the United States. These are the representatives that have come from Israel to represent both Israel and Jewish life. Yes. And they're fantastic, Jim. That's right. And again, they are re-energized with Natan as, as their leader. So, and again, the statistics show very, very clearly how getting young Jews in their, uh, basically in their 20s, getting them to Israel makes an enormous difference in how they feel about their Judaism and how they feel about Israel. And, and there are literally tens of thousands every year that are doing that. And what we're hoping for is to dramatically yet increase those numbers. So over a relatively short period of time, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of young people going to Israel, having their lives affected by it, and having their, their vision and view of Israel and Judaism affected by it. And that will make an enormous, enormous difference over the long term. It's, it's the same as compound interest. Somewhere around 65%, maybe even slightly higher, 65% of American Jews are not even going to Israel once, let alone twice, and let alone choosing where they're going to vacation. They're going to vacation in Israel. No, they want to go to the southern France, and they want to go to Prague, and they want to go to Africa, and often they never go to Israel. There are Jewish students in college who take a junior semester abroad and rarely take is, uh, go to Israel. And so although I, I agree personally now with everything you say about how powerful visiting Israel is, in real numbers, the number of American Jews who are experiencing what you're talking about is relatively small. And what are you going to do? What do we do 
about the vast number of Jews who yet have not gone to Israel, and it's not even on their radar yet. And I want to come back to the other question I asked you. There is within the American community now a growing liberal group of young people who look at Israel and don't see the champion that you and I see. They see the oppressor, the, the people who, the country that is somehow denying Palestinians their own self-determination. And on college campuses, Natan Sharansky calls the college campus now the new occupied territory because so many of the young people on the college campuses feel distant from, and it's harder and harder for the state of Israel to get a speaker approved to go onto the college campuses. And that's the challenge that's facing you as the chairman of the board of governors of the Jewish agency and Natan. So to the first part of your question, there's the, the phrase from Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Yes. We can't rely on that uh, with respect to Israel. I agree. We have to put in place programs to really attract these young Jews to come. And between Lapid, Birthright, Massa, all these programs are bringing, bringing over thousands and thousands of young Jews every year for extended periods of time and for intensive programming in Judaism uh, and Israel. So all we have to do is, number one, give these programs some time to work, and number two, actually fund these programs so that everyone who applies can actually come over. As for, as for the college campuses, I don't, I don't worry. First of all, I'm just, I, I'm blessed. I, maybe I'm not even Jewish because I'm, <laughs> I'm not a worrier. But this is, this is a, a, um, a battle that we have to, we Jews have to fight. This is a, a fair fight here in the United States of America. I believe with all my heart and soul that we are on the side of right. Mm -hmm. uh, that Israel, Israel is um, a great nation, uh, especially in comparison, in comparison to so many other nations in this world. Israel has nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to hide from. It is a true liberal democracy in a, in a part of the world that up till now has basically been, been uh, populated by autocratic dictators. And all we have to do, sounds simple when you say it fast, all we have to do is get our message out. And there's no doubt in my mind that we have uh, here in the United States the organizations in order to be able to do that. In fact, my argument would be that a number of the organizations that are working here in the United States to do this should actually close up shop decamp from the United States and go over to Europe where there is real anti-Semitism and there's real, real work to be done. Mm -hmm. How did you get to be you? And what I mean by that is, and I, and I, want, to, and I want to make sure I say it correctly, you know, sometimes there's a popular notion. Well, if a family has money, that's how they get to be who they are in terms of their stature and their role in the Jewish community. You're about a certain quality of character and when you were growing up as a child, how many brothers and sisters are there? You? No sisters, three brothers. Three brothers. And what kind of Jewish home did your mother and father provide for the <laughs> four of you? I'm sorry to say, <laughs> we had bacon in our home from time to time. Uh, I keep kosher now, but we had, we had bacon back then. But my how, Why do you keep kosher now? How did that happen? My wife is, comes from a kosher home. Our home was kosher, and... Uh, Did she make you more observant? No, no. Uh, I'm kosher. I didn't say I was observant. Uh, our, our home is kosher. And then after my kids, after about 10 years, when my daughter was about 10 years old, she's now 30, I decided, you know, I have to keep kosher outside the house, not just in the house. It would be terrible for her to hear that... I'm not being kosher. And so, notwithstanding the fact that I don't like fish, I, I, uh, 
and keep kosher inside the house. Okay, but come back to your own home. So you, so you ate bacon, but... Rarely, but from time to, to time. To what extent was there my, a sense of cause Jewishness? Because even though my parents were non-kosher, uh, they were totally, positively Jews. They were never ashamed of it. They were always involved in leadership positions. My mother was the first uh, female president of federation here in New York. My father was the uh, chairman of UJA. And when we sat down around the table for dinner, this is what we heard about. So just as for me, there was no doubt in my mind when I got out of college that I was in grad school that I was going to work at Lowe's Corporation. There was also no doubt in my mind that one of the things I had to do when I found some time during the day was to be involved in the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it just, you could say I was brainwashed, you can say I was inculcated with it, but it, it was just there. And how about your grandparents? Um, my my uh, mother's parents came from Germany, and they were uh, good German Jews, very stoical. Uh, my father. When did they come here? About 1900. Okay. As did my father's parents. From? Uh, from uh, Russia and Ukraine. And so it was an intermarriage of sorts. Yes. Which we used to say. Yes. It meant something different than it means now. Yes. yes. And, they, and the two sides, the German and the Russian-Polish, gets along fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And from there, you know the phrase Yiddishkeit. Mm -hmm. There is sometimes, in my view, a mistake made when people talk about being Jewish. For me, Jewish has to do with to what extent is an individual committed to Jewish identity. There is a wide spectrum of Jewish observance that one can find his or her own place. Mm -hmm. And that where you are on the Jewish observance spectrum is a very personal matter. And I believe every expression of Judaism is Torah Misenai, in some way is an expression of Jewish life. The real question for me is to what extent is there a Jewish core inside an individual, regardless of the level of observance. It sounds to me like, in some way, this is what you were yes. brought up in. Uh -huh. A world in which observance, again, your family found its own style of being Jewish, but being Jewish was critical to your mother, your father, and to you. Do I have it right? Absolutely. Okay. And when you and your own wife create a home for your children, uh -huh. is it the same thing? I certainly believe so, and I have uh, a daughter who is 30, uh, another son who's 29, and one who's 26, and they are all very, very positively Jewish. That's wonderful. You understand that that's not typical of Jewish life today. You know that. I mean, so on one Maybe hand, one day it will be. Yes. So on one hand, I want, you know, from a Jewish perspective, I say mazal tov to you. Good for you. And at the same, same time, I don't want in any way to, I don't know, to make people who are not as successful as you feel bad. The reality is we live in a very complicated world in which young people are drawn in all kinds of directions. For a simple reason, because they're, they're not living in a ghetto. They're not living in a yes. gated community. And so they're, they're, they're subject to all the temptations of the non-Jewish world. And the distractions. Yes. Okay. Because temptations has a pejorative meaning. Uh -huh. And I want to say that there's, we are competing, you used this phrase earlier, we're competing in the world of ideas and experiences. And we want to give our young people the best experiences and the best opportunity to understand what it is about Jewishness that you love so much, which is my next question. In terms of Jewish values, Jewish sensibilities, can you articulate what it is about values or Jewish sensibilities that you find most appealing, that in some way grab you the most? No. I don't, I don't, now maybe I'll have to take up with a shrink and go sit on the couch. I don't believe, I don't believe no, it. No, no. I don't believe it. I, you know what? You're telling me that there's nothing about Jewishness 
that somehow resonates with you in a way that you just love? Uh, I am I am comfortable and at home with Jews. My friends are all Jewish. But if you're saying, can I put my finger on some reason why that is? The, I'd say no. It's 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 cultural mm -hmm. in one way or another. It's not one thing. It's probably thousands of things. It's the world. It's the world that I grew up in, which is the cultural Jewish world. And I think that that world, while while we do live in a secular world intermingled with Gentiles of all sorts, we Jews do have a slightly different way of looking at things. For example? We worry more. We, we think for, for Gentiles, it's not so important. The, the, the issue of intermarriage is not so important. For a lot of Jews, it's really important. There's, by the way, there's, there's one other item that I think is really important, and that is Israel. Because if you know you're Jewish, then one thing you do is you look to Israel and you see what's going on. And in fact, I would argue that if Israel were the land of milk and honey, surrounded by lots of, lots of friends and didn't have all the political issues that it has, then it really would not be nearly as much uh, the focus of our own Jewish life. The fact that Israel uh, is surrounded by so many states that want to do away with it, the fact that it's uh, in some ways an underdog uh, and that it's uh, really a light unto the nations in the Middle East and the world, I think, uh, makes those of us in the diaspora um, more intense in our feelings towards Israel and therefore magnifies our sense of Judaism. I find your perspective to be spectacular. And one of the things I want to do on Shalom TV, you, know, you talk about how do we get the message out? It's your message that I want heard all the time and I want to use television as part of the means by which that message is disseminated. And the message has to be that much of what's said about Israel on CNN and in the general media and in the New York Times is a serious distortion of what life in Israel is like and what the struggle Israel is facing is all about. And I wonder to the extent to which you also are, I don't know, frustrated by the way you see Israel presented in the general American media. Somewhat frustrated by the way it's presented in the America general media, very, very frustrated by the way it's presented in the worldwide media. Um, I mean, news you're talking now Europe specifically. Europe, Middle East. Yes. Um, but you know the um, the good news is that in in the days where we got all our news from newspapers, uh, where you didn't really have much choice in what you, what you read or what was available to you, it was very difficult to hear an opposing view. But now, if you, if you, because of the internet, if you want to get information, there's a, a fire hose uh, of information available to you. And it's really, really easy to get. Mm -hmm. And so you look, you look at uh, an issue and you, you see it as a problem. I look at it and I see it as an opportunity. And all, all we have to do is get young Jews just a little bit hooked. Get them somewhat motivated to learn more and the, the information is there and I truly believe that uh, they will seek the information mm -hmm. and they will grow from it. Mm -hmm. I'm an optimist. I love it. How many times have you been to Israel? Lots. Lots. Have you had moments that you feel epitomize the best of Israel that in some way touch you that you keep all the time? 
we had the typical wonderful uh, family trip to Israel. My son had his bar mitzvah there oh. uh, 16 years ago. Uh, the family went when we dedicated the uh, Tish Family Zoo in Jerusalem. So, yes, the, the family has been there several times. My daughter, uh, when she was at Harvard, um, was writing her, her um, honors thesis on the settlements in, in uh, the West Bank. And uh, I was going... Uh, there, I think, with conference for the conference of presidents, and we were meeting with, among other things, we were meeting with Prime Minister Sharon. So I said to her, "You want to come to Israel and do some real first-hand research?" And she, she said, "Sure." And so she came, and came time to go to the Prime Minister's office, and we took care of the business that we had to take care of. And then I said to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Sharon, "This is my daughter." She's writing her thesis on the settlements. Do you have anything to say to her? And I remember he started out by saying, if you've read the Bible, you don't need a map of the West Bank. And then, and then he went on for 20 minutes wow. talking about it. And that's where she got her wow. education. Wow, that's a wow. Yeah. Wonderful. I don't know if you want to speak about your own perspective on the two-state solution. Do you think it is wise for the state of Israel? Yes. Do you hope it happens? Yes. I, I think it's the only solution. Do you expect it to happen? In my lifetime? Yes. Uh, I'm hopeful that it will happen. I'm hopeful that uh, the Palestinians will get enlightened leadership that wants to bring that. I think, I think there, there is the possibility for a deal to be done. In order for it to be done, I think the Palestinians people have to be educated uh, because I think they've got totally unrealistic expectations, for example, when it comes to the right of return. And they, they don't, I believe that uh, through their media, Israel and Jews have been so vilified mm -hmm. that that uh, they just the the Palestinian man on the street just doesn't understand what Israel is all about and what Israel is trying to accomplish. I believe that, and I say this to politicians all the time: Israel is a democracy. The people of Israel desperately want peace with the Palestinians, but they want a peace that will be long-lasting. And if, if the Israeli people feel that their prime minister is not of the same mind that they are in terms of that desire for peace, they'll vote him out and they'll bring somebody else in. And, and so, and I, I think that as soon as the Israelis see that there is a Palestinian leader and Palestinian people, that desire peace, then they should be able to uh, hammer out an agreement in relatively little time. I agree 100 percent. You say it beautifully. Do you believe if there were a government, a Palestinian leadership, which the Israeli people believed in, they would be prepared not only to make territorial concessions, they would be willing to remove many of the settlements on the West Bank? Yes, I think I yes, I think that uh, as has been demonstrated, uh, it is possible to come to an agreement where less than five percent of the current uh, West Bank land would uh, become a part of Israel. The th but the thing that we also have to ask, and I think loudly, is why is it? that Israel can be a Jewish state and still have Arabs living there as equal citizens, while it's accepted by the world that in a new Palestinian state, it has to be Yudin It has to be free of all Jews. Doesn't that flabbergast you? Yes. And 
do you have an answer by the way the rhetorical question you ask do you have even a, a possible answer why the world would even tolerate that being said let alone tolerate it happening you know what it is if you if you repeat a lie often enough people will believe it and this is this has been a mantra for so long about no Jews living in the West Bank that people accept it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's the triumph of politics over rationality. And therefore, should we be saying over and over again in opposition to it, it's not appropriate? Yes, we need to, we need to hold up a, an enormous mirror to this uh, hypocritical uh, way of thinking and way of talking. You're an extraordinary you. human being and a much. wonderful Jewish leader. What a pleasure it is. May you grow from strength to strength and lead right now with Natan, the Jewish agency, in helping to build and rebuild and sustain Jewish identity and Jewish sensitivities and Jewish commitment to the state of Israel. And I hope any time that there's an issue that you can speak to me about, we'll have the opportunity to speak again. Absolutely. Kol and Shana Tova, a happy and sweet new year to you, and Jim Tish. Thank, thank you him. very, very much. And that was my meeting with Jim Tish, chairman of the Board of Governors of the Jewish Agency. I hope you enjoyed meeting him. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to the ideas expressed by Jim Tish. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support. Mechaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. <laughs>